Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Get Outdoors PA webinar, Developing Creative, Innovative, and Viable Summer Camp Programs. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. My name is Nikki Tusher, and I'm the Director of Training in Get Outdoors PA with the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society. Uh, with me today is Emily Gates, the Director of Strategic Partnerships, and she is running the technical side for us. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few, few housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded and all participants are muted. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them in the chat box at the bottom left side of your screen. The speakers will either address them throughout the presentation or we will compile them at the end. You will receive a link to the recorded webinar and a copy of the presentation slides following the webinar via email. Also, this webinar has been approved for .1 CEU or one contact hour. The final presentation slide includes a link to the quiz and instructions, so please make sure to take the quiz immediately following the presentation. A little bit of background on who we are. Get Outdoors PA is a joint initiative among community and statewide partners that strives to connect citizens with outdoor recreation activities to increase their appreciation and active use of parks, forests, public spaces while imparting a message of environmental stewardship and healthy living. Get Outdoors PA partners are committed to providing outdoor recreation and education events in the communities they serve. These events are designed to connect people to the outdoors through opportunities to learn and promote acti other activities such as hiking, fishing, hunting, camping, and biking. Our Get Outdoors PA flagship partners are listed on your screen. In addition, Get Outdoors PA currently has 84 state park partners, 155 community partners, which are made up of park and rec agencies, land trusts, environmental education centers, and more. We have a few learning objectives for you before we get started. Throughout this webinar, participants will learn how to develop creative summer camp programs, Participants will also learn how to create effective marketing for summer camp programs and how to recruit volunteers and manage staff. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Autumn Arthur joined the Strawberry Hill staff in 2011 following animal behavior and education internships with the Philadelphia Zoo and the Elmwood Park Zoo. Through these opportunities and her experience with the National FFA organization, Autumn developed a dedication to environmental education and community engagement. Autumn holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies from Gettysburg College, where she also obtained a minor in education. She is currently pursuing a Master's in Museum Studies and Nonprofit Management with John Hopkins University. In her spare time, Autumn enjoys exploring the great outdoors through hiking, kayaking, and horseback riding. We also have Denise Bauer, Denise has enjoyed educating the public with Wildlands Conservancy for 22 years. One of her responsibilities has been overseeing the summer camp programs for the last three seasons. The 12-week program has grown to three locations. In her spare time, Denise enjoys spending time with her family, gardening, and hiking. Um, and finally, we have Chris Rebert, who is the park manager for Dauphin County Parks and Recreation. Chris grew up in South Central Pennsylvania and joined the Dauphin County Parks and Recreation team in 2004, where he continues to enjoy challenging work at Wildwood Park, which is a popular urban wetland in northern Harrisburg. He has an MS degree in Park and Resource Management from Slippery Rock University and a BS in Recreation Park Management from Penn State University. He enjoys sharing his enthusiasm for the outdoor world through teaching, natural history, conservation projects, and improving parks for wildlife and visitors. Um, would you all like to say a quick hello? Hello. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Hi, everybody. Thank you, and now we're going to turn it over to Autumn. So thank you all for joining us today. I am very excited to tell you a little bit about Strawberry Hill Nature Preserve and the summer camp program that we have developed over the years. So really quickly, some background on Strawberry Hill if you're not familiar. We are um, a nonprofit environmental education center down in Adams County, about eight miles west of Gettysburg. 
And we serve primarily the Adams County area. Um, and we see about 5,000 school children every year for our field trip programs from Adams County. And then we also see um, groups as far as Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Baltimore for some of our programs. Um, so we were founded in 1986 to provide environmental education and protect the Swamp Creek watershed, which a lot of our property encompasses. Um, there's some quick facts up on your screen about the preserve, so if you're ever down in the Adams County region, uh, we hope that you get a chance to join us. But pertinent to summer camp, um, environmental education has always been a core part of our mission, and we have had summer camp in some form since 1986. Now, um, today we are run by two full-time staff, and then we have some part-time staff, and we're primarily supported by volunteers. Um, we're also a private nonprofit, and we don't receive any funding directly from federal, uh, state, or local governments. So that kind of sets you up as an idea for where camp has been building for us. And I'm going to take you back to 2011 which is when we first started to really make a major shift in our CAMP program. So in 2011, CAMP was called Junior Naturalist Summer Camp. And we had um, one age group each week, and sometimes they were full day, sometimes they were half day, and we only had it running for a couple of weeks during the summer. And what we have switched to and have switched over the years and really launched in 2015, 2016, is that our program is now Monday through Friday for grades pre-K through grade seven. So all of those ages come to us full day every week for eight weeks during the summer. Um, we've also shifted the marketing for our camp a little bit. It's not junior naturalist so, more, so, so much anymore. It's now our adventure camp. Um, you can see up in the right-hand part of this slide, we did definitely borrow from that Survivor TV show logo a little bit to convey the kind of feeling um, that we're trying to attract with our summer camp. So we still have weekly themes, and we still tailor our programs to different age groups within each week, but everything is now simultaneous, and we're hitting different interest areas, art, animals, water, things like that. So when we started working on really revolutionizing our camp program for Strawberry Hill, we knew that there were three big areas that we needed to address. The very first thing was figuring out what our community needed. Next was figuring out what partnerships we could leverage in the community to accomplish a better camp. And then the last thing was to take a really hard look at our staffing and figure out the most effective um, and cost worth way for us to staff our program. So you can see we have some sub questions next to those. We'll come back to each of them as we move through talking about Strawberry Hills Camp. The very first was thinking about community needs. So market research was so important for us. Um, we kind of had been looking at camp one way for almost 30 years. We had been thinking, we want to teach kids about the outdoors, so we are going to have a summer camp that's teaching kids about the outdoors. And that's fantastic. I think that's the goal that a lot of our organizations have. But when we started to think about community needs, we realized we needed to flip that on its head. Um, instead of talking about what we wanted to teach kids, we needed to think about what does the community need from us. So our three big questions were, what do parents and families need from their summer camp program? What's the most effective way to communicate with the public? And how do we appeal to a really wide audience while keeping the roots of environmental education as the main part of our program? So we looked around our area, and we looked at the other organizations in Adams County that were offering summer camp programs. And we realized that we were all kind of doing the same thing. Um, it was one age group at a time. It was usually a half-day program. It was only a couple of weeks during the summer. Nobody was offering an all-summer full-day option simultaneously for elementary-aged kids. Um, we also realized that we didn't really want to design the program specifically around people who want their kids to learn about the environment. We knew that if we built a program well, and had the environmental education component, 
those people would come, but we need to design the program around, pe program around people with other needs, um, specifically childcare. So when we did all that market research, we figured out that nobody was doing full day, um, all age camp. And we kind of saw that that was our competition, but then we could also work with our competition to get better information. So um, what we did is we worked with five of the organizations that are up, up on that screen. We worked with um, the Rec Park from Gettysburg. We worked with the Arts Council. Um, we worked with the Y. We worked with Harrisburg Area Community College. And we ourselves put together a survey. So there were all these groups who were competing for summer camps, but we realized that we all needed better information. And we, it was a short 10-question survey. We all used our social media platforms and websites to distribute it. And um, I'm going to highlight a couple of the key question responses that we got back from that. So one of our questions was um, the importance of different features when parents are trying to decide what program to enroll their children in. Um, and you can see that we, we listed out some features that we thought were, would be ones that parents wanted to target. And um, we were happy to see, maybe not so surprised to see, that guided outdoor exploration was number one. That was most important um, when they were looking at programs. What we were surprised to see is that lunch and breakfast and organized sports for the families that responded to the survey, they were the lowest priorities. Um, and those were things that we had in the past tried to put a lot of focus on. Um, we had worked with the school district to offer free lunch and free breakfast to all of our participants. We had tried to include some baseball or kickball activities in our camps. And we were learning that that really wasn't um, a priority. So while they were things that we could keep doing as part of our camp, uh, it wasn't what we really wanted to base all of our marketing on. Um, and on the side of these slides, on the right-hand side, you'll see a couple of quotes. These were quotes that came back as part of uh, that survey as well. Um, so we had this parent say that they knew that they were sending their kids to a structured program that would allow them to interact with nature. So that structure was a really important part that we wanted to keep. Another important question for us as we're thinking about the needs of the community we wanted to know how much they thought was appropriate to pay for childcare. Um, and we got back a mix of answers, but mostly in the four to six dollar or seven to nine dollar per hour range for childcare. Um, and for some families, childcare is summer camp. That's their only option. Um, so then we were able to sit back and look at our camps and look at our fee structure. And we said, you know what, our camp is $4.25 an hour for someone who's not a member of the preserve. It's less if you are a member. So we're actually on that low end of what people are willing to pay for childcare. So we can focus on that and let people know that, but then also show how we are so much more than just childcare. There's a really high value added. And then the third question that I want to highlight, um, we work with our local school districts to get Adventure Camp advertised through the school districts and they endorse it as an academic program because we align with PA's um, state education standards. And we were focusing on that a lot, again, for our marketing. Um, and then we got our survey results back and we saw that of this question, parents are a lot more focused on their children gaining independence and critical thinking than they are on the actual academics of it. So we're, of course, not going to throw all the academics out the window, and we still align our programs with those state standards. But um, as we're talking to parents and as we're marketing our program, we've really shifted our focus to talking more about how spending that time in nature and coming to camp allows them to make new friends and foster relationships and um, mature a little bit that way. So once we thought about community needs, we realized, okay, we are going to go full day, we are going to go all ages at the same time, um, and we're going to do it for eight weeks during the summer. Then we started to look at how we could use partnerships to take some of the burden of delivering a camp program off of ourselves and use the community to do it. 
So the first one we tried was a partnership with the Rec Park in Gettysburg. And we learned some really important things this year. Um, first of all, Strawberry Hill, like I said, is about eight miles outside of Gettysburg. Um, and for some parents and families, that's a really long drive before work in the morning. So the Rec Park in Gettysburg is a central location. And we were able to get a bus donated to our camp program so we could pick kids up in Gettysburg and bus them out to our facility and make it really easy for them to get to us. Um, so that was a massive benefit of partnering with an organization that was in downtown Gettysburg. Um, this was also the year we were able to offer free breakfast and lunch. Um, but we learned some other lessons too. Um, the rec park uh, is physically very different from Strawberry Hill. Um, it's pretty flat, there's no creeks, there's no real shade, um, and we were spending part of the day there. And families weren't so keen on that. So while the location was great, um, using that site for any of our camp programming wasn't as ideal. Um, and we also learned a lot about just working with another organization's space. Um, we had things we had to figure out that we didn't realize we would have to figure out, like who was going to take the trash out at the end of the day, whether it was Strawberry Hill staff or the Rec Park staff. Um, so we also learned to be really clear about expectations when we're working with a partnership. So then the following year, we moved over to the YWCA, which is also in downtown Gettysburg. Um, and this is the year that we rebranded as Adventure Camp. So we still have a convenient pickup drop-off location. But now, instead of spending part of the day at the rec park, we spend two afternoons a week swimming in the YWCA's pool. And families love it. There is no public pool in Gettysburg or Adams County. So this was a fantastic opportunity for families who couldn't afford a pool membership to have their kids go twice a week and get to swim. Um, a lesson that we learned this year is that for our rural community, pre and post care is not all that viable. Um, for pre and post care before the camp hours and after, families in our community are using neighbors or grandparents or other family members. Um, so we weren't getting the pre and post care numbers that we needed to have a sustainable pre and post care program. So we, um, this will now be our second year of partnership with the Y. Um, we've uh, launched our registration and we've already got some registration signed up for camp. So we're really excited about that. This is a partnership that we feel is going to move us into the future even further. And the last thing that we looked at was staffing. So. Um, when back in you know, 2009, 2010, 11, uh, when we were just having one age group a week, we had one person basically who was running camp. He was Mr. Eddie, he was Strawberry Hills lead naturalist, and because it was just one age group at a time, um, that was no problem. But as we started to expand camp and have multiple age groups a week, obviously one person can't be everywhere at once. So then we started to widen it out and use more of our naturalist staff as camp counselors. And what we learned really quick is that a lot of our naturalist staff um, were just not up for the challenge of camp. It is, as a lot of us know, a long day in a long week in a long summer. Um, and so for a lot of our naturalist staff, running camp full day was just not feasible and they were getting burned out really quickly. So instead, we have turned to using primarily interns as our lead counselors. Um, and these are college students who are pursuing degrees that are related to environmental education. Um, and they are high energy and excited and fantastic at enduring the long summer. Um, and to be honest, it's a lot more economically feasible for us. We do provide a stipend for our summer camp interns, and we also provide housing. Um, but it's nowhere near what it was to um, pay to staff our naturalists for the summer. So we also have some additional staff. We have junior counselors who are 16 and up, and we have our volunteer counselors in training who are in 7th and 8th grade and up that help us out to keep our ratios low. So our ratio ends up being between 6 to 1 and 8 to 1, depending on age group. Um, 
and we usually have three lead counselors who are our summer interns. So after we figured all of that out, um, that is when we start thinking about all of our value added extras. So this is when we dive into themes and figure out what themes are going to get kids excited to come to camp and what weekly field trips can go along with those. Um, this is the pool is one of our value added. We also bring in lots and lots of guest speakers to help supplement the intern's naturalist knowledge during camp. Um, if you can get snack donated, I highly recommend it. It's a great way that we've been able to bring down our dollar, our uh, bottom line on dollars. And then something that we've developed over the years that parents have loved as a value added is um, we said 18 page, but we just finished this year's and it's now 20 pages. We have a 20 page handbook and FAQ that answers pretty much any question that a parent could possibly have. Um, and it's really helped us just develop strong communication with our families so that they feel comfortable coming to us with any questions that they have. And speaking of questions, if you have any, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat box or you can email me after the presentation is over and I'm always happy to chat. And thank you. Thank you, Autumn. I do not see any questions at this time, but again, if you put them in the chat box, we can answer them at the end of the presentation. And next up, we have Denise. Hi, thanks for including me. I am happy to be importing any knowledge that I may have acquired over the years. I was, a few years ago, promoted to that very snazzy title of senior naturalist. Before that time, I was a naturalist with Wildlands Conservancy for, oh, I think it was about 19 years at that time. And I taught summer camp for a very long time. So I was in the guts. I understood everything that needed to go in to producing a strong summer camp. And along with that title came an edict, which we'll get to in just a little while. I think the base of any programming is your vision and mission. And our vision and mission took us many days to hammer out because Wildlands Conservancy is a greater than 40-year-old land trust with three prongs. There is the environmental stewardship prong that concentrates on um, stream improvement, trail development, and habitat restoration, restoration. The land protection prong that has actually protected more than 50,000 acres of environmentally sensitive land within the Lehigh River watershed where we are located in education, which is where I am stationed. And our mission is to grow awareness of the natural world and hopefully instill in a desire to protect it. So you're coming at that from three different vantage points, and this is what we came up with. It is very easy to run off tangentially and come up with some fantastically interesting ideas, which can take you all over the board. A good place to start is with your vision and mission. Are your ideas fitting? Is, is it going to fit cohesively in everything else that is happening in, in an organization the size of ours? And these are those edicts I mentioned a moment ago that came from our Vice President of Education, Mr. Scott Cope, remember that name? And the first one was that I would be hiring, training, overseeing, and scheduling staff that would include naturalists, interns, and volunteers. I was also to create hourly curriculum for all of our age groups of campers, which includes, includes pre-K, the you and me parent-child teams, um, kindergarten to second grade, third to fifth grade, and sixth grade up. That's many hours of curriculum over the course of a week. And lastly, we needed to institute pre and after camp activities to better accommodate the schedules of the working parent. In our area, there are very large employers, so it made sense for us. So instituting all those things caused a tremendous increase in registration, and things really took off for us. You're looking at Aurora right there. Aurora is one of our education animals, and she looks a little scary, but she has a very, very sweet temperament. So what happened is education registration, education and um, summer camp registrations rose 150%. 
We had a 150% rise in seasonal stash, staff, and we also had the addition of a second and third camp location. This summer we have our feelers out, and we may very well have a fourth or a fifth camp location next year, and we're certainly going to need more seasonal staff to accommodate that. In order to accomplish this, we analyzed everything in the 30 years of camp previous to the time that I had had those edicts handed to me. And we decided some things were maybe a little too vague. We began our camp many years ago in the 80s with names like trail rompers and trail blazers, and it worked for that time. But as time went on, we found that actually those age ranges that I mentioned just a moment ago really worked best. We also had some titles that we developed that maybe were a little too vague. I trolled, I troll the internet, we all do. We borrow from each other. We participate in educational opportunities and we take that inspiration and we correct things. Um, we, we create things. I had participated in a webinar on biomimicry a few years ago and I love the concept. The thing is that no one seems to know what that is. I had someone in our field ask me what biomimi cry was, so we decided that was a little too vague and it was time for to, time for it to go. In order to um, make sure that we accommodated everyone, we took a look at where things a little maybe too age or gender specific. Fairy camp was very popular with us, but there was no way we were getting a fifth grade boy to sign up for fairy camp. So we expanded the idea, idea of fairy camp to include older children. Were some things ready to retire? Were they too diluted? Did we carry them for too long? We had child versus wild camp for many years and it was very successful. Registration began to, to drop. We had three, three levels of water camp, which we, we fine-tuned. We had adventure camp, wildlife camp, art camp. And over the years, they just, they just lost their meaning. So we rebranded things. We looked at things that maybe we thought weren't as strong as they could be. And with the advice of, of parents and their children and, and our staff, we actually sit down with parents of campers that are on staff at the end of the year, and that is the group that really truly is most brutally honest with what needs to change because we all are marching to that same mission. We are all behind um, successful results within our organization, so some of the best ideas actually come from them. And at the end of every season, we sit down, we have evaluations with naturalists, we have evaluations with interns, but we also have weekly meetings with the naturalists and interns to collect their input, as, their input as well. So all of that information that maybe wasn't so successful, we used, we packaged up, and we used it to move forward. We failed forward. And to that, to that um, idea, to, to the theme of failing forward, what we did is we took a look at the camp themes that we had been carrying even themes that were created pretty recently because trail rompers and trail blazers was far, far behind us. We took a look at things like fairies and gnomes. Remember I said we could not get a fifth grade boy to sign up with that? So what we did is we changed it to Secrets of the Forest, and that became a lot more intriguing, and it was able to move into fantasy beyond the fairies and gnomes. And for the, the big kids, we actually create Legends of the Forest. Lizards and Wizards, that was one of those things that I found trolling the Internet. It was from Delaware Nature Society, and it was wonderful. They were using it as a Harry Potter-themed camp. Well, what we did is we turned it a little bit more into chemistry and physics of, of nature, and we expanded it this year to become science of nature. Child versus wild. <laughs> Child versus Wild worked for, I'd say, probably five years. And when registra reg registration dropped, we decided, well, let's just take the survivor theme and expand it into recreation as well. And it became Outdoor Skills Camp. 
In art and nature, we just got a little tricky, created the double entendre, and we call it outside art now because it's art-based in nature. But we also always try to think outside the box and come up with new and exciting art ideas. That right there is Miss Hannah, dressed as her superhero for Superhero Day at school. And she is an eco-warrior and a repeat summer camper. We were really excited when she sent us that picture. Nature's song. Nature's song is new this year. And it is in response to requests from, from parents, from children, from some of our naturalists who wanted to include more music in camp. And what we did is we're using it as the very first week of summer camp this year. Our first week of summer camp is used as training for new naturalists after, of course, <laughs> the, the three full day training period the week before. But it accommodates preschool group, preschool children, and the you and me groups. And the naturalists come in, they follow the camp around, and they have a good idea what to expect when things go a little bit more full to tilt boogie the following week when we really start to get busy. Water camp, we had water one, water two, water three, because it is really the most popular camp, and we decided that maybe it was time to narrow it down a little bit, to give it more of a theme. So we now have living water, which is primarily focused on animals, we have Water's Edge, which is primarily focused on the properties of water and a whole lot of play. And we have Running Water, which is human impact. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't cross over and there aren't animals and everything and there aren't properties and play and human impact in everything, but we try to keep to really focus on the theme. Eco Warriors is a tremendous opportunity to take take advantage of partnerships that you have in the community. It's also a really good time to showcase some of the skills of your staff. We have people that are expert birders and, and expert hikers, and we bring them in to present to the entire camp during that week. The whole idea of eco-warriors is at the end of, of that summer. You've had these kids here, a lot of them, for, for many, many weeks, and you want to inspire them. You want them to understand that even as a child, they have power to go out and influence. They have power to change their world and power to make some environmental change. That is the goal of eco-warriors. And the very last week is wild endings, which is a recognized client service because a few years ago, during Eco Warriors Week, I had one of my favorite campers come up and hang on me crying, saying, now I have to go to the mean lady next week, and just broke my heart. So we created Wild Endings, and that's a week that we don't create curriculum. Each naturalist uh, gets to create their own ideas, finish up the snack that's in the kitchen, work on the supplies that are in the closet, and we keep costs down that way because it's not one of the biggest weeks of the summer. What we try to do is because we have so many repeat campers, we try to keep things cohesive, which means at the very beginning of the summer with Outdoor Skills Week, those kiddos are going out and they are building shelters in the woods. They're going to stay up all summer. They'll visit them periodically. We'll certainly use them a lot for Secrets of the Forest and Legends of the Forest. And the last week of camp, they're going to a second last week of camp, Eco Warriors, they're going to dismantle them and they're going to make brush piles for the creatures that live on our 77 acres here at Cool Wildlife Sanctuary. We also are able to keep things very cohesive with our water camps. What you're looking at right there is the kitty car wash that was built by the kids, the, the big kids, for the little kids. Every week on Friday, every week during water camp on Friday, the big kids set up a water cycle obstacle course for the little kids. They mentor them. They encourage them through it. They're kind of like exhorters on the side encouraging the kids to to get through, and we call it the H2O Olympics, and the big kids nurture the little kids. That kitty car wash was rebuilt so many times until it just bit the dust, and we were able to recycle as many portions of it as we could, 
and just integrated that piping and in, in, in that plastic in other, other activities. You want to include family and friends to make things interesting. I, I say it all the time, and it may sound horrible, but you have to exploit your children, exploit your friends, exploit your partners, and bring them in. Jazz things up a little bit. Make it interesting. During art camp, well now, outside art camp, my, my child, who is a local art teacher, comes in and teaches clay because I, I don't have rolling pins. I don't have a bunch of canvas. I don't have cutting tools, but she does. And she brings it in, and it's a very exciting part of camp. The kids love it. That gentleman right there is a bird bander that used our site for years for research. And during Eco Warriors Camp, he came in, he taught the children how to band. He, of course, did it himself. He showed them the process. He allowed them to help him measure and weigh. And after the bird was processed, certain children were actually allowed to release the bird back into nature. All the way at the bottom, left-hand corner, that is Smokey the Bear. Everyone knows Smokey the Bear. And what has happened here in the past is there wasn't enough of DCNR staff to pop someone in Smokey's costume and have someone lead Smokey around. So that is when you take advantage of someone that you may know. In my case, once again, someone I gave birth to, popped into that Smokey the Bear costume, got to live out her fantasy of, of being a mascot, and was a major help when we had no one else to step in. You have to use what you have. We have snowshoes that are used often during winter programming. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use them during the summer. We allow the kids to work in, in, in two partner teams to help each other put them on, and then walk around in the grass on the snowshoes. Those inner tubes are used every Tuesday for Tubing Tuesday and are used multiple times a week for the children during summer camp. On the upper right-hand side is a picture from our trail cam. We leave that set up quite often, maybe actually over the entire course of summer, and the kids will bait the cam. We'll move it around to areas that we see have a lot of signs of movement, and that is just a very small part of our way too large deer herd that lives here. On the lower right-hand corner is one of those shelters, and we had the children insulate them that day, and that's also a whole bunch of stilt grass. So if you have a problem with invasive species on your site, you can take advantage of your campers as well and allow them to help remove some of those invasives. They feel really, really good about themselves when they do something like that. And in the bottom left is one of our turtles that might be tripod. I'm not sure. Tripod has three legs. All of our education animals are here because they are unreleasable for one reason or another. And he was actually wandering through the classroom that day making a comparison between box turtles, wood turtles, and diamondback terrapins to see how they moved on land. And then the kids went off and built a pair of flippers and went out and visited the creek. Ah, uh, wow factors. This is where you take advantage of your partnerships or just really good people that you have met along the way. We have a gentleman who has, who's an arborist. And he was trimming trees in a staff member's yard. And we discovered that he has a really big heart and a great harness to pop on a child and help them climb to the top of the tree. So Joshua comes in here once every summer, and he helps all of our campers get to the top of a tree. He's just an all-around good guy. Leave No Trace, Subaru National, Leave No Trace was touring curriculum. And Diane, one of our directors who is just magic and pulls things out of the air, brought Leave No Trace here to us. They presented, they gave us their curriculum, and we were actually to develop, able to develop some of our own things out of that and use it year after year since they were here. L.L. Bean, everyone knows who L.L. Bean is. L.L. Bean has a local store, and we go into their store, we'll take our education animals in, we'll take activities in, and we will entertain their shoppers, meet people, hopefully have them come to our programming. But in exchange 
in exchange, L.L. Bean will come with some of their, their interesting new equipment and do presentations for our campers. Archery Addictions right there on the left had a grant to promote the sport. So they come in for a very nominal fee. And once again, Archery Addictions was brought to us by a staff member who was at a birthday party and discovered them, brought their information to us, and they jumped right on. Nurse Betsy, that's the person who lived in my house for 28 years. She's an ICU nurse, and she came in during Child versus Wild, an outdoor skills camp, to do first aid with the children. Usually on a large stuffed frog, it makes it more interesting. To include some additional, what we call more wow factors, we have overnights. We have two on our site and one on an additional site. The campers get to come for free. Their families pay a small fee, and we extend the experience for them. The six-plus group, some of those kids have been here 9, 10, 11 years, and they could probably actually lead camp for the younger children. So we decided that we needed to add a little bit of pizzazz for them. We needed to expand their experience a little bit, and we take them on field trips once a week. We take them to our preserves. We actually have nine of those. We take them to state parks. We take them to the sites where our, our partners are, um, Dinell National Heritage Corridor. We actually lead a camp out of their site at Humor Park in Easton. We also take them for water camp on a bike and boat trip, which is something that we run. It's, an, it's a national award-winning program that we run. I could have included in here the Da Vinci Science Center. We go to Da Vinci and we present for them. Da Vinci comes to us and they pre present for us. We barter with people. Roe Ebert has her own PBS program. She's a local artist. She comes and she presents for us and we give her children a free week of camp. We also extend the camp experience with um, fighting nights, s'mores and a hike so kids can come back with their family. These are the two additional sites that we are using right now. The DNL National Heritage Corridor, which is uh, uh, on site of the National Canal Museum, shares presentation time with us. They present one day of the week, and we present four days of the week. It works beautifully. We have a complimentary mission, and we also send the kids there on the field trip for engineering camp week. We partner with the city of Bethlehem, and they allow us to use one of their sites. And in exchange, we go out into, their, into all of their summer camps, and we take our animals there, and we present for them. So we get to use the site for free. 2018, uh, next summer we have so many opportunities, I'm not sure. We may come up with site four and five. We may come up with site four, five, and six if we only have the staff to cover it. That is always the limiting factor. Right here, that is staff from a few years ago, and I, I, I love those faces. We do not use just environmental education majors. When you are looking at that group of 21 people, we have a few formal educators. We have two animal rehabbers. We have a physics and a chemistry geek who were wonderful for Lizards and Wizards Camp. We have a pre-K teacher. We have five environmental education majors. We have a journalism major. And five people are here just based on background knowledge and pure and enthusiasm. We have turned people away with master's degrees because they just lacked the demeanor that was necessary to engage the children. And we also like to cross-train those people so that they get to work as part of our bike and boat staff program so we can have a lot of people but keep them busy during the course of the year with bike and boat and our additional community and group programming. So how do we recruit? I've had an awful lot of really, really cute, pretty slides here, and this one is not so pretty, but I wanted you to have everything in one spot to understand how we can build staff up to, that was 21, it's actually probably closer to 30, 35 people over the course of the summer. And we do it with a whole, whole lot of 
outreach. I have eight career fairs in this next month. We start um, with naturalist and training. We found that we were losing kids when they hit about seventh or eighth grade. So we brought them in as naturalists in training. That is a child that is 14 years or older. And we found them as number one former campers who came back to help out. We contact our teacher connections and they pass the information on children that they think might be interested in this. Our volunteer coordinator brings people in. And also volunteer websites, volunteermatch.org is a wonderful website to use to find volunteers for all levels of your organization. The idea is that those naturalists in training have spent time with us, learned procedure, and now they can hit upper high school, senior year high school, college level, and they are now going to move on to be naturalists and naturalist assistants. This year I'm happy to say that we can actually pay them. To be a naturalist assistant, you have to be able to guarantee a minimum of 20 hours a week. If you can't guarantee that minimum of 20 hours a week, then you can be a volunteer and we can be a wonderful line item on your resume. A lot of former campers, a lot of program participants come back to us as interns. Now they really are receiving college credit to be considered an intern. Other than that, you are a volunteer and those are a lot of the people that we meet at career fairs. We also post on um, college career, career websites as well. Now, after you've been an assistant, after you've been an intern, ideally those are the people that we want to come back to be a naturalist. Now, it doesn't mean that you had to come through our system. We advertise a lot on our website. We do do those career fairs. And a lot of times people will come to us just as program attendees and find that they really like it and they have the background, so we invite them to stay. So, so much of this is through matriculation, and that's the ideal route that you, you want to follow. That is my contact information. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. But I also want you to note that right under me is that gentleman who handed me that edict and in a lot of pressure those years ago. He really likes to receive email. He loves statistics. He, he, he loves to ans answer grant questions. Please feel free to contact Mr. Cope and um, flood his mailbox. Thanks. Denise, thank you so much. That was great information. And now, Chris. Hi, everybody. Looking forward to our little tour of Wildwood Park today. I wanted to start with a little, a little background on Wildwood Park in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And as you can see, there's a lot of photos here with water in them, and we are a wetland site. We have a 90-acre lake that's a shallow lake. We have a lot of different kinds of habitat, so it makes for a nice suitable area for environmental education, which is our, our theme and core mission in the park. Uh, we have, this is a park that's, that's owned and managed by Dauphin County Parks and Recreation. And as you can see, this little red oval gives you a little outline, it does a, a delineates the park and, and shows you how it's wrapped around and and, and centered between highways and byways. So there's I-81, you have 322, these are major highways that surround the park. And if you look a little bit on the top, uh, towards the top of the photo, that's the Susquehanna River that flows just, just adjacent to the park. So it makes it a nice, convenient stopover for migrating waterfowl, uh, wading birds, and this is an urban park, like I said, that it does a lot of, it has a lot of functions. So we're, we're receiving, uh, waters that would typically, you know, during a big rain event, flood Harrisburg, but one of the, the jobs of Wildwood Park is to divert those waters to the Susquehanna River instead of through the city of Harrisburg. So it has, it's a multifunctional facility and gets a lot of foot traffic with park visitors. Um, we have a, an, an area that, that has been 
really, it, it, it just it, it changed so much over the years. The park's over 100 years old, and it used to be known as Wetzel Swamp, and today it is a, like I said, a very popular wetland that has a, a man-made lake in it. So the picture on the right, you can see the Pennsylvania Canal. That's one water feature, and then the bottom is, the, is some of the swampy area that was here historically. Now, environmental education has been occurring on site for uh, since the 1980s, and in 1999, the OY Nature Center was built to help provide a, a, uh, a home base for a lot of the environmental education programs that take place on site. Waiting for the slide to advance. There it goes. I have to do a barred out call here to make sure you're all awake. There we go. So the Nature Center is, uh, like I said, our home base for programs. We do offer as a park year-round programs for your typical school school groups in the spring and fall. Um, we have a lot of different festivals throughout the year. Summer is certainly the time for day camps. And looking at our day camp schedule, we have really age-specific camps. So it, this is a, a park that we have uh, nature explorers, ages 5 and 6, will be 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. So that's the only camp that currently that we have it, it, this is a very simplified day camp system that we have on site. Um, it's a good starter system for day camps, and it, it's a good way to start out. We're finally getting to the point after years of day camps like this where we're just about ready to make that plunge like Denise was talking about having, and, and also Autumn, about having more than one camp occurring at the same time. So, so that's, a, that's something to point out that may be helpful to, to think about. Uh, Wildwood Way, ages seven through nine, is is the most one of the most popular camps. As is Junior Naturalist. That age group in in this area, age seven through eleven, is really the easiest age age to attract to day camps. We have found, um, and we do tend to keep most camps the same year to year, at least with title. Once we settle into a, a title that works, um, for example, Junior Naturalist is is a, a camp that we've had for, for many years that is, is very, very popular. And um, Age Pacific does work well. We, we, we have a specialized camp digital photography that spans ages 10 through 16. Um, and that one is, is pushes the limits a little bit because there's a, you know, it's a pretty big difference between a 10-year-old as far as uh, what kind of abilities they can um, they can incorporate into the day camp as compared to a 16-year-old. We have <clears throat> some of the some of the goals that we are aspiring to attain with the with the kids that are coming to camp. We want to develop awareness of the natural world. Uh, the main goal is getting these kids outside. Some of the some of the youth that are involved in the camp. This is really their first time, believe it or not, it outside. Um, so that you know. To be in a wetland on a boardwalk looking at, at garter snakes is something brand new. Um, so we're looking to really enhance that, um, capitalize on creating a foundation for understanding ecology, building naturalist skills, and of course, the, it, our summer day camps are different than school groups. We're not teaching standards during day camp like we do during, during the month of May, especially for public schools that visit the park. Camps are different. The, the goal is we, we want to you know, let the kids have fun. And while they're having fun, they are learning as well. So they're getting an understanding, uh, depending on which camp it is especially. Some have uh, more depth to ecology than others. The Nature Explorers for ages five and six is pretty basic. You know, five and six-year-olds, you're getting them outside and learning how to go for a walk. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to share with other students. and and, you know, get used to hiking. Um, when you get into the older kids, Wildwood Way and Junior Naturalist, that would be ages 7 through 11. 
that's where we're, we're diving deeper into building knowledge and understanding of uh, learning natural history and, and how to identify the, the birds that are here, um, the different processes that take place. We do center almost all of our camps are, are centered around wetlands. Uh, that is our, our theme at, at this facility. And, you know, they're maybe studying macroinvertebrates and instead of just, you know, catching crayfish, they're learning how to identify down to the, you know, down to the uh, genus of, of being able to figure out what what is living in the stream and how does that relate to some of the fish that are also in the creek. So they're learning to identify those mayflies and get their hands on them too and then releasing them and <laughs> hopefully doing it without having too big a consequence to the, all the critters that live in the creek. So uh, canoeing is a component in, in three of the camps and <clears throat> The kids, I think their favorite thing, honestly, is to get muddy. As long as it involves getting muddy, it, it works really well. Um, talk about Outdoor Week. This is a camp that started about eight years ago that was not well attended when it first started. It was actually called Survival, Outdoor Survival and then Outdoor Skills, and we, we finally honed the name down to Outdoor Week. It, is, it, it has a focus of, of survival, it has a focus of research and also adventure. So this camp has the youth involved in two of the research projects that take place long term in the park. One is songbird and hummingbird banding, and the second is turtle tagging. We've painted, we've tagged with pit tags over 200 painted turtles in the park in the last five years with partnering with the local state museum and colleges, and the kids just love research projects. It's something that has really taken off, and hopefully it can take off more in the future. We're just really starting out with, with research in the park and getting more partners involved. Um, some of the other things that they're doing in, in this camp is, and throughout is testing and monitoring water quality, very popular, and um, thinking about our adventure component, uh, we have a, if, the, if it's a great week, and, and every year it has been, we reward the participants with a, uh, an all-day canoe trip down the Susquehanna River, and that's always a big deal for them. Um, another camp is, is complete submersion in digital photography, thanks to a local professional uh, who, who teaches the, the class. And provides Canon SLR digital cameras to all the, the students who enroll in the course and teaches them that instead of just shooting your, your camera on, on auto, it's, it's all the details on how to get off of auto. So this, this class is really appropriate for this site. Uh, while it is a very popular site for photographers, this is a place where it's convenient and easy to get close to uh, certain kinds of wildlife that are sometimes hard to find, like wading birds. So it's a good opportunity for kids, something a little different from what, we're, what we do normally. So we're looking to do more of that in the future. Um, but the, and that is one direction that we are heading, is, is how can we expand camps with limited staff? Uh, and we want to consider some other locations, since this is a park that is very, it, it, some days it's just crowded. Uh, with, with people. We have one day, day, one day day camps that visit the park oftentimes in summer and some days it may be 100, 150 kids from another camp visiting for the day um, and other days it may be just 30 or 40 kids but we want to find ways to provide opportunities for these, these one day day campers as well. So <clears throat> there's lots of trails that they can hike. Uh, we want to provide some guided opportunities for them even though they're here for just one day. And also, it's important to have self-guided opportunities. So that's something, this is the direction that we're heading. Uh, we have, like I said, trails to explore. There's six miles of trails. And that, that works great, but we want to enhance that. So there's opportunities. We're working to improve habitat. We want to bring in more great egrets, continue to have the wetlands here so that the state endangered great egret can have habitat to, and will visit the park and provide opportunities for photographers and, and visitors. We came up with a, 
Um, well, it's, it's called Art in the Wild. This is the fifth year of this installation. It's a installation that takes place every summer, and it'll be up for seven months. It's, these are trailside art installations, and they're made of mostly natural materials. So we bring in approximately 15 artists to do the installations, and it's a, a juried exhibit. And it's really brought in a lot of new user groups to the park. Uh, it, it gives self-guided groups another motive to take that three-mile tour around the lake and see the art installations. And it, we find that it encourages, it encourages play with nature. It softens that, that line between the trail and, and, and nature. Um, we do want to encourage people to interact with the outdoors especially during camps, and not feel like if they, if they uh, touch a, a bush, they're going to get you know, deer ticks and poison ivy. So uh, this is one of the installations last year. It's hanging wood cookies, and they're each about 12 inches in diameter that were really interesting to watch during, especially on a windy day when they would spin around, and they had certain prints on each of them. So um, we even had an art installation that had a focus of on plastic bags in front of the nature center, and that is actually still up, although the bags have been removed. So, uh, so trying to work with these these different groups that are visiting to to pull them into the day camp. Uh, going back to the day camp theme, what can we do to expand day camps? And and those are some things that we can do. Um, currently, we we have two to three internships each summer. And this is an opportunity for those interns to get their feet wet. You know, there's got to be a chance for them sometime to become immersed in environmental education, and this is it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. So, and to echo what Denise said, it's certainly not limited to just biology or environmental science majors, and really does depend on that charisma and, and just uh, generally someone who's excited to, to work with youth is, is what we're looking for and has worked well. Um, Marketing, how do we get all these people to sign up for the day camps? And they do fill quickly. Some are full already, for, for the, some are filled already for the summer. And one thing that helps us is to release the day camp schedule on January 1st every year and sort of make a little hype about that. Say, okay, you know, in the newsletter, we put it out there, remember, day camps are going to start sign up because they do fill up quickly. And, and it encourages people to, to think ahead. Um, we do an e-blast, and that's an email to approximately 6,000 email addresses. That's very uh, helpful for all of our program signups. And we can do a Facebook push if we need to, and that's, uh, that's helpful as well. Um, thinking about it, who's coming to the camp, a lot of the attendees are repeat from year to year. Uh, and word of mouth is important. You know, you're getting friends, uh, cousins, and siblings that are uh, d joining joining the camps as well. So lots of experiences, and we think that's the most important thing to to provide that opportunity. You know, we do have some scholarships that are available for uh, underfunded uh, situations, and you know, getting that that experience outside and. Uh, Having an opportunity to learn natural history, we, we, we really do focus on, on getting the base uh, foundation for ecology, and, and it's worked well. Um, I'm looking forward to see if there's any, any questions that might be out there before I wrap things up. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions, so I did want to follow up and just say if you want to find out more about Wildwood Lake, uh, Wildwood Park, stop by uh, the website, wildwoodlake.org. If you're moving through the Harrisburg area, stop by, and we, uh, you know, keep in mind it's an easy to get to facility. Hope to see you at the park. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Again, that was wonderful information. Um, at this point, again, this is the last call for questions. And while I go over a few more notes, we'll keep an eye out for questions. Um, I just want to thank Autumn, Denise, and Chris again for speaking with us today and providing the wonderful information, and thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, as a reminder, the recorded webinar and presentation slides will be emailed to you. And for those desiring CEUs, you can 
uh, follow the link on the final slide, which we'll be advancing in just a second, and you'll have the quiz and the instructions. Um, and one last note, if you're interested in becoming a Get Outdoors PA community partner, you can uh, follow the link on the last slide, or you can call me, Nikki Tusher, at PRPS. Um, and I, I, we do have one question. Um, Melissa is asking, when do you begin to recruit seasonal staff, such as counselors? Well, this is Chris speaking. I can tell you, uh, Melissa, I'm running late this year. So I just started March 1st. I probably should have started February 1st. That was my goal. So <laughs> uh, I find the best place is PRPS.org, P-A-E-E. -E, and if you can find out through colleges, uh, there's oftentimes platforms, uh, folks who can help publicize it through universities. So this we is usually uh, go ahead, Autumn. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. Um, I was going to say we start advertising gently in the January February range, um, and then in March we really really push it. Our internship applications are due by the end of March, and then our applications for any of our junior um, junior counselor staff or the volunteer counselors in training are due at the end of April. Um, and like Chris said, we go directly to a lot of the colleges. Um, we've been able to build kind of a network of professors that we know are in related fields that we can let them know that our applications are open and they kind of recommend some students over for the program. This is Denise. We also are able to post on a lot of college websites in addition to that. We post on our own website and we have our first cutoff date in the middle of April. What we do is we set up a couple group interviews. You can get to see how everyone relates to each other and that way you don't have to be interviewing all the time as well. So we'll set that up the middle of April, but we always end up pushing it back. And to be perfectly honest with you, if someone shows up at the beginning of June and they want to volunteer for you, we're going to take them. Fantastic. Thank all of you for answering that question. Do we have any final questions? Okay. Again, thank you to Autumn, Chris, and Denise for the wonderful presentation. We'll keep the last slide on the screen for a few minutes if you need to take down any, any information. And thank you all for joining us.